So if you're listening to this, that means you've had a week's gap from episode one, part one. Which means that you've had a week where you've been wondering what on earth was going to be said next in the next pieces. Wondering what other nuggets of information were coming from my guest. And you've had a week where you haven't been able to apply those nuggets because you didn't know they existed or what they were. Which is a little bit frustrating, really. Because imagine how much more efficient, productive, or amazing you could have been. But you know there's a way around it. You know that you can pop along to Patreon. www.patreon.com slash Sunday Lunch PM. Or to Spotify. Have a look at the feed. And there's a little lock. Click on the lock and it'll ask you to pay. It's price for coffee. That's it. A month. And you'll get everything a week early. Uh, and you won't have bits like this uh, in it with me wittering on about becoming a patron and things like that. So, have a think. And anyway, I'll shut up now because you're probably thinking, just get on with it, Nigel. So yeah, here's the, uh, the second part of the show. So, I have a number of sponsors, affiliate links, um, in the way that it's set up, um, that have kindly allowed me to uh, um, share their services, really. The first one um, is Mike Clayton, and Mike runs PM online PM courses, and it is a great resource for um, getting those fundamentals of project management uh, trained, reasonably priced, uh, and Mike um, presents it in an accessible and um, uh, clear manner. Um, you can check out some of his um, uh, videos on, on his YouTube channel and kind of give you a view of where they are. But um, the, the code for that, if you go to nigelcreaser.com slash online PM courses or all one word, lowercase, that'll redirect you to it. Um, there's very different levels that you can um, buy. You can buy individual courses, you can buy pathways as well, if you like. Um, and I get a kickback off those. Uh, Mike kindly uh, shares me that. So um, if you do jump on and use it, I hope you find it really useful. Um, I think he has money back guarantees and things like that as well. So there's a very limited risk um, on that. So. Uh, Jump on that, and that again is nigelcreaser.com slash online PM courses. And did you? I'll give you a story from the book. We solicited war stories from people on LinkedIn, which I wish we had thought to solicit from you. Next edition, we'll get one from you. I'm sure you have a hundred of them. War stories were stories where things went horribly well or horribly wrong. Um, for example, what my friend in Boston who has, um, I'll get to the cultural one in a second, uh, who, who did the project management office, one, I forget the exact details, but one of her project managers was on a call and got lost in cyberspace. So in a breakout room, wound up staying in the breakout room, couldn't back, get back to the main room, lost the entire meeting based on that, like a Black Mirror episode or something. That was <laughs> that, right? And then... Uh, the cultural one that Rich came up with, which was a bunch of guys uh, or people visiting Japan, and they were there's a very formal greeting card thing, I believe. The greeting card or the business card represents you; it is you in a sense. And one of the guys saw this gleaming table and couldn't resist taking his card and skimming it across the table. And the Japanese were horrified. I would be anyway in the States, but it was double that in Japan. It was a complete insult for him to do that. He was non-cognizant of the culture. So I think working internationally and meeting internationally, and by the way, when we work internationally, we're mostly going to meet internationally. We're not going to go over the wealth of things that we're going to meet. Respect the culture. Know the culture you're going into. And I say that whether it's uh, me going over to the Middle East or me going to, say, Alabama. You know, you may not know the differences here, but in the north, we are a lot, the north of the United States, we are a lot more, we're not as friendly. We're not as sociable as the southerners say. 
So I, I just came off of a cruise recently, a lot of Southerners. They're so warm and friendly. There's differences among us between the North and the South, but the Southerners are more, how you doing? How's it going? Do you want some iced tea? There's just a, a casual neighborliness that they have that we, especially in the Northeast, if you go from the New York to Boston to Washington, D.C. corridor, we don't have time for pleasantries. <laughs> it's all, let's just get business. We're not unfriendly. We're just not, you know, New York doesn't have time for that. So I have to acclimate, if I work or teach in the South, to that level of neighborliness. I remember I taught in Indianapolis. I was doing a meeting, a, t a class. A lot of the people, had, that's the center of the country, Midwest-ish, Indiana. A lot of people were driven up from Kentucky. Boy, could they talk. They'd come back from lunch, and they were all socializing. I had to all but get a whip to get them back into the meeting. Because they were socializing and yeah. whatnot and having a good time. So, yes, organizational culture is important. This is why I say uh, this stuff is so fundamental. I mean, if I'm going to hire somebody to run my project and they say, I have 10 certifications like you do, Jim. I know Microsoft Project like the back of my hand. And I'm, I'm an agilist and I know JIRA. And I say, yeah, but can you talk to people? Can you communicate with people? Can you talk to stakeholders? Can I trust you? That's what I care about. I kind of don't much give a damn about your certifications. I want to know, can you do you have soft skills, what they call power skills now in PMI? So um, I think those are important. And by the way, as I think about it, either I make these things up as I go along or they pop into my head as we're talking. I think those are much more needed the way we're doing it now because you can't see my body language. I taught... Um, PMP for nine years for whatever reason remote two different customers and I never set foot inside of a class when that ended and I set foot in the class I said oh, this is so much better when I explained concepts like earn value or critical path people doing this people doing this <laughs> right <laughs> or what a, exactly <laughs> now if there's 10 people on the screen I can't see them all some of the cameras are off yeah. but I can feel the energy in the room too yeah I would, in the previous classes that I had, I would have, I would get to quality. No offense to quality people, but I, I know quality reasonably well. And I found this interesting part where a lot of people just fall asleep during it. We were getting there at 2 o'clock in the afternoon on the second day of a, of a, of a brain dump from me to them. They'd be, so I would have to say, let's take a break. That's harder to see on yeah. the remote. So I, I think we have to have better antenna on remote because uh, yeah. we just don't see everything. Yeah, I think, I think it's sometimes, it, yeah. no, no, I uh, get that. I think it's, it, it's that, it, it's funny. It's some of the discipline of running meetings. And I had um, listening to, uh, and, and meetings are such a big thing of what we do. And everybody said this meeting could have been an email to, I mean, it's kind of all these right. things, which is great. Cause I wouldn't have read the email if someone had sent it. So, you know what I mean? So then I'd have nothing to do with those scenarios. So that's where I end up with that. I think, yeah, if it's been an email, I'm unlikely to read it. So therefore right. it's even less effective than a meeting in my mind. But, it, but and I think the thing is, is it, it's a communication and it's a, it's a communication tool. It's one of the millions of communication tools and it is the most effective. Face-to-face mm -hmm. mm -hmm. -face meeting is the most effective if it's done right. Right. If it's done poorly, it mm -hmm. can be the least, the biggest waste of time you can imagine. And that's, that's, right. the, that's the problem, isn't it? Because an email, you can do it really quickly and really mm -hmm. effective, ineffectively, mm -hmm. because um, you have no control over and there's laughing in the background of my children who are <laughs> uh know i've got a podcast on and they they seem to be <laughs> entirely silent except for when i start recording <laughs> right um, no so i'll have some conversations with them later um it doesn't always pick up because this microphone's directional but even so it distracts me sorry about me looking no away to that one now. um yeah so uh, Bo and bonnie you're getting a call out on the podcast that you're being a pain <laughs> in the backsides so I'll tell them that I've done that now. They'll show um, up later on. <laughs> yeah, they will, yeah. Uh, so, uh, and I've lost my train of thought, except that I was good. Yeah, the fact that, and, and I remember, um, it's the Manager Tools podcast, which is one of my favorite podcasts from a point yeah. of view of learning stuff. And, and actually, your Wayne's, Wayne Tamal's one was one of my early podcasts oh, that I used to listen okay. to. The, uh, um, the, um, 
Oh, what was it? The, the something middle manager, wasn't it? The Greg G. Middle manager yeah, or something I like that. I actually haven't listened to it. I only know him through yeah. through Rich and through that his book. Yeah. I don't know his podcast. Yeah, it was, it was, it was quite, okay. Yeah, it's quite a long time ago that he did that pod, pod, podcast, yeah. but it was one of the early ones I listened to. But but the thing that um, uh, they say in the manager tools one was around using planning a meeting, having an agenda, mm -hmm. setting expectations, mm -hmm. controlling right. the meeting. Agree, mm -hmm. thinking about what you're going to do, keeping to the agenda, the timings of the agenda, all these things that if you, whether it's face-to-face, -face, whether it's remote, poor meetings tend to be ones that don't have that kind of structure. Right. Now, you have some meetings that are kind of updates, and that's kind, kind of okay. They can be a bit of meandering because some people, they need a little bit more longer, some people don't. But then the difficulty might be that you've got a talker like me, who's going to take 15 minutes to tell you what you could have told you in five, and someone who's <laughs> after me who really wants to get out of that meeting quickly because they've got to drop to a client meeting or something like that and would like to give their updates and, and then excuse themselves. But so, again, it, the more structure you put into those meetings, now sometimes you need to add that flexibility. And like you said there, thinking it's about thinking about the purpose of the meeting, thinking about right. the outcome you want for the meeting and thinking about the people in the meeting, what their input and what their output is, which takes time and effort, which we don't right. always do. And that's the thing that I think, where, where do you, you, how do you see that on that preparation for meetings? You know, it's interesting. I, I have a lot to say about this, but I'll try to condense it. First of all, a person might be taking notes saying, if I have an agenda, if I have objectives, if I invite the right people, if I if I have uh, action items, I will have a great meeting. This is an important ingredient missing, them. So I'll give you, I'll give you an interesting example. Um, uh, a young lady called me up, contacted me through my website. Oh, it must be 10 years ago now. Her project management office had been dissolved because a project had failed, therefore they blamed the discipline of project management. I won't even get into that. The only two people who, who were... <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Right? Yeah. So yeah, the only two yeah. people who were left... Right, we're not going to use hammers anymore because yeah, we bent the nail. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So the only two people who were left were her boss, the director, and her. She wanted me to come in and help revitalize the PMO. So we talked about slides I would do, presentation I would do. Uh, and I came in into, I, I, interestingly, as a side note, some of it was remote, and it was long enough ago that we were walking over to some camera and holding up our laptop to show people who were remote, right? Ridiculous stuff. But, you know, it, that worked to some extent. I did my thing. I gave my talk. Now, I wasn't there to mentor her. That wasn't my job. I was there on her request to um, help rebuild interest in the PMO. I did my talk, and then... I sat down and she wanted to say something. She talked in such a monotone that I observed that people were, this will happen, drifting away, starting to talk to each other. They had started to tune her out. And it wasn't like, let's talk because she's boring. They just started to naturally talk to each other. Um, so if you have to have all that right, but you have to be interested in what you're talking about and be interesting and get people's attention. The other thing I tell people is, uh, if you're not, get presentation skills. I went to a presentation class back in 1990 in Chicago or someplace. Oh, you're jingling the keys in your pocket. You're boring, this and that. It's hard because they'll video you, but that's what you want. And to learn. Now, I've honed whatever I can do to speak from years of teaching. Some people will say they're an introvert. Guess what? So am I. Don't have, use that as a crutch. I don't care if you're an introvert. Yeah. Too bad. You need to get up and speak. You need to speak clearly and convey what you're trying to say. You need to be interesting to your crowd. So you have all those things in place, being an interested and interesting speaker. Now, I'm going to save your viewers money on buying the book if they want to buy it. You know, two of the big, two biggest pieces of advice in the book. So one is, is, is a corollary with what I just said. Be large and in charge. It's our meeting, but you're running it. There's only one person in charge of the meeting. It's the project manager. If the, pro if the meeting fails or a series of meetings fail, then if I'm running it, I can go home and say to my wife, I ran these meetings today and Joe hijacked it and Nigel kept talking and this other guy kept interrupting. And, you know, if I didn't have them, I'd be fine. And she would be right to say, 
wasn't it? Weren't you running it? Or my boss would say, weren't you running it? Yeah, but what could I do? Well, there must have been some strategy to keep these people from distracting you. So you need to be large and in charge. Now, here's the number one piece of advice. I'm going to back into it. I uh, There's a consultant named Alan Weiss. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he's an interesting guy. Alan is the kind of consultant. He didn't do this exactly, but I'll give you the type of level of consultant he is. He's the kind of guy they would have gone to one day and said, Steve Jobs is leaving the company. We need to find a replacement. He works at that kind of level. Okay, so or worked. He then wrote a book on million, he calls it Million Dollar Consulting, a million dollar consultant. He now consults to consultants like me. I've been mentored by one of his people. He writes books, how to get business, how to consult, writing books, etc. I went to one of his sessions at, and, and he's down in Rhode Island, which is not too far from the Boston area. He came up, I was right near Logan Airport. We went to a meeting and there was a, a gal that got up and said, I gave my customer. 10 recommendations, and he only did one. Alan said, did he pay you? She said, yeah. And she, he said, you're upset that you didn't do it? She said, well, yeah. He says, stop looking for unconditional love. Okay. Now, Alan is also a psychologist. Do not go into a meeting expecting to be liked, wanting to be liked. Example, I go into a meeting. I'm running the meeting. It's a one-hour meeting, and our agenda is to plan a project. We have an hour. Plan whatever we can in that hour. Let's keep it short. And I've got a guy who likes the sound of his own voice. And for 10 minutes, he drones on about something they used to do and this and that. And in my head, even if unconscious, is saying, if I stop him from talking, he won't like me anymore. If that's what I'm basing it on, then... Guess what? The other X number of people in the room are looking at me saying, Jim, can you do something here? So I'm going to have to go to him and say, hey, you know, Bob, very interesting. And right at that point, I'm interrupting. Right at that point, I'm interrupting him. And I'm saying, Bob, with all due respect, you've made your point. If there's nothing further, if you have something really important, I'll talk about other important things. We can set up a separate meeting. You want to hear him. You want to respect him. You need to stop him. And then move on. Stop worrying about being liked and worry about getting through the objectives of the meeting. I've had numerous times people just, you know, cross their arms. They're a little bit offended. I'm not yelling at them. They get it. And very often, you said it yourself. You said that you like to talk. I don't know you very well. You're aware that you like to talk. People who like to talk know they like to talk. Or the people who are have more devious things in mind, the goblins, we call them the bullies, like to intimidate. And we try to shut them down as well. So everything from the innocuous, the people who like to talk, the people who go off on tangents, you must control that situation. Stop worrying about being liked. Start worrying about meeting the objectives. Because I'm going to tell you, if you come out of a series of meetings and your boss says, what were the result of these meetings? Well, I couldn't finish it because of this and that. Your boss may say, yeah, he's a pain. Or he might say, aren't you in charge of the meeting? Because guess what? I would. If you work for me, I'm going to say, you better learn how to run that meeting. So stop worrying. And in fact, I'll close this on one thing. Alan Weiss, I subscribed to his newsletter. Coincidentally, this week, one of the things was, I forget the exact quote. I put it in a slide presentation I'll be doing, was about being liked or not being liked. I, out of nowhere. I haven't seen him in 10 years about that very thing. And I put it into there about the, he says, leaders don't worry about that. That is not their thing. We're not trying to be disliked, but that is not the primary thing. I don't think Jeff Bezos is sitting there to, do my people like me? They probably don't. <laughs> they may not. He's not really worried about that. He's worried about the customer service and the customer has got other problems and whatnot, but they're worried about servicing the customer. I'm not worried about going to a meeting and having people like me. It's just wrong. So there's save yourself the 30 bucks or 30 quid or whatever in the book if you want. And do that. And it's going to be hard at first, but you have to do it. And if they come up afterwards and say, you cut me off, yes, I did. I had to because we had to get to the meeting objectives. Do that. Practice that. Practice being large and in charge and not being liked. Your meetings will be better. Yeah, it's great. It's That's one of the things I've heard about before is with that sort of scenario where, and I think it, it elevates in this remote environment, hybrid environment as well, is the fact that if you've got a dominator in the room, and you've got people, so that dominator will 
dominate and over talk some people you've got to be really conscious of you you can see it in the room can't you where someone you've got the person trying to make the point and you've got the the high d just talking over the top of them or the high i right and the person who there who kind of well they talked over me i'm not going to say anything and, and they, they they're looking right. at their desk or whatever they're starting to do right and you go jim can you just finish can you just finish that point you were trying to make you were making mm-hmm. trying to make right. whatever um right or you stop the other person and say can something to finish when they're remote, you can't, you don't immediately pick up on, especially if they're not got right. video on. You won't pick up on that person going down like that. So your attention right. on when people are getting cut over has to mm-hmm. be really finer, doesn't it? You, you need, and yeah. that's where I, I think, and and it's kind of we, we, we'll go into a four-hour AI conversation if we're not careful now. The, <laughs> right. the, are you? I, I, the thing I've always struggled with, again, I'm a bit of a talker, be one of part, be part of it. I'm a terrible note taker, can't read my own, <laughs> own handwriting, always right. try to find solutions for this. <laughs> right. Uh, got to the point where I started using um, OneNote and right. OCR recognition and stuff like that, and never quite got a solution. You know, the, the, the project manager's book that we always used to have that we all had our notes in, that mm-hmm. a, a doctor could have written mine usually. You know, right. It's right. Like two, 256 encrypted. Um, and <laughs> So the advent of AI, the advent of products like Otter, the use of, we, we do it ourselves, we use Teams and let it transcribe as well at times mm. in these in these mm-hmm. meetings to um, allow us to capture that and be, then allow you as project manager, rather than having to have, and I've had this and it doesn't work very well, having a, a more junior member of the team take notes, take minutes, mm-hmm. or I, at one time I was very lucky that someone had, had a PA who was wasn't my PA, someone else's, but they came and took notes in the meetings. It never was quite right, and they just get actions, yeah. and the words weren't right, and things like that. And yeah. AI doesn't get it right, but it it gets ninety six percent of it right, which is is just right. as good as human. I think. Um, mm-hmm. How you see that kind of transform the the, the ability to do meetings? Because one of the things you were saying about where people get lost in cyberspace or just tune out and think, oh, I should listen back to that. The ability to have a, a digital copy and a transcription later and trying to remember the conversations, I think is really powerful, but it's not mm. endemic yet in, in doing it. And part of that's going to be CO2 storage, the amount of CO2 it's going to use for right. keeping all those recordings. But there's a benefit right. there, isn't there? You know, it's interesting, the AI thing. I think you mentioned, did you mention Otter, O-T-T-E-R? Yeah. Did you say yeah. that or no? Yeah. So yeah. my Otter, Otter AI, I've used that, <laughs> used that for a while. <laughs> Not it's, not so uh, much for meetings, uh, but just for my own um, uh, your own stuff transcription. Yeah, for when I write ideas as I'm walk, going for a walk. It's uh, it's interesting because I here's my own AI stories. First of all, the the, it's, it's, the world is sort of before and after Chat GPT, which came out last November, and, and sort of yeah. all of a sudden it was a big. It's been there, and all of a sudden that was the tipping point. Um, I was asked to. Three or four months ago, by one of my colleagues, to information interview with a guy who wanted to get into project. I do this all the time. I mentor people. People want to talk. I'll talk to yeah. anybody about getting into project management. A woman from the UK me spoke to me two me weeks too. ago. We spoke. Yeah, we just we just do it right. So he, I gave him a Zoom, and he came in, and it popped up and said Otter ATI, which I'd never heard of. And what is that? Okay, fine, whatever. So we're talking, and we're talking about his potential career and other stuff. Some of it's confidential. It ends, and then it comes up and says, your Otter AI is ready. And it, it, for those who aren't aware of it, it does recording, and it does transcription and whatnot. I said, what is this? So I had to create an account to find out, and it was recording everything we said. And I wrote to the guy, and I said, did you record? I don't know what this is. Did you record it? He said, I never heard of it. And he Google, couldn't, isn't it? Be- it's, it's it? Google Meet. So sometimes it's Google has got some. I know that, um, although I've got Otter, I think it maybe if it was through a Google Meet, it might have done it through and offered it through that. Just a spontaneous. No, it was Zoom because it was my it was yeah, my right. meeting. In fact, he it's couldn't weird. have triggered it through my meeting. So we went back and forth. He says, I don't know what you're talking about. And I contacted Otter to let them know. And the other thing was, I, I said to him, we have laws here. You can't record me without my consent. I, you can't, and, and different states have different laws. I think he was in Connecticut. It was a two-way street. Either one of us said, you can't do that. That was my first thing with that. Interestingly, 
there's no reason for me not to use it. I don't really need it. I tend to get my notes other ways. Yeah. But here's an interesting tidbit for you. Today, Rich and I, my colleague who wrote the book, had a, 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 a Zoom meeting, which I sent him, uh, because we're putting together a presentation on this very topic for PMI. As I went into Zoom, it added an AI app today. Came up yeah. at the bottom of the screen. I barely have a chance to look it up. Just letting you know and your viewers know. Rich didn't get it yet, so they might be rolling out slowly. It's some yeah. kind of A app that pops up right at the bottom, right where it says camera and, and share screen, right in the middle of there. So there is now one built in. If you go into Bing, it's there. Other AI story that's interesting that's not about meetings, but I think your, your listeners and viewers might find of interest. Um, Rich teaches at Boston University, my alma mater. And uh, he's a master lecturer there. And he invited me into a conference he had a few months ago to host a session with three or four people to discuss project manager offices or something like that. And um, one of the sessions was about AI, because that's the big thing. And two of the professors got up and talked about the use of chat GPT specifically. They might have used, what's the other one, BARD. And... Um, they experimented. They asked the AI tool to, oh, here's what it was. They were using a, a, a scholastic thing. Students wanted to have a party. It was a fake thing. Students wanted to have a party. And they have X amount, Y, Z amount of money. And they said to Chat GPT, give us some options for the type of parties we might do. Well, Chat GPT came, here's the good news. Chat GPT came back with a weighted, W E I G H T E D, table of the various options of what it would cost and the best one of those three, whether to have a, a boating thing or a drinking, whatever it might have been, right? Those various options it even created a charter. It created all these great artifacts that you and I would have to churn out over, I've written how yeah. many charters? Dozens of, and it would churn that out. That was the good news. The bad news is, and I know I'm veering from, earn, from, uh, from meetings, but it's important. The earn value numbers were wrong. For those of you who don't know, earn value is a technique mostly largely used in the government here in the States, other places as well, to gauge performance. You have to use math, dollar math. It calculated the numbers dead wrong. So they had to go back and calculate the numbers right. So ChatGPT got it partially right and partially wrong. And in my own experiences with AI, I have asked it questions where it came at. One of them was, Something about George Lucas and Star Wars. Oh, you know what it was? It was, I said to it, where did the name Indiana Jones come from? I could look, I could Google that. I was curious. It said, well, um, he went to school in Indiana. And I looked it up. George Lucas never went to school anywhere but California. Ever. At any point in time. Ever. And I went back and said, you're wrong. He said, oh, sorry about that. So... <laughs> Take AI with it right now with a grain of salt. It's it's new. Uh, yeah, we fear I think, it. I think it's, it's new. A, Relatively, it's the same. It's the same as using Google, though, isn't it? You, you Google something, you check it on Wikipedia. You, you have to you, you, anything you get on Facebook, anything there, you have to have that le level of skepticism on that. And I think the tool right. is using those sort of tools for absolutes is 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 not a good idea. Any anything other than an expert is, is a bad idea to take. And even then, some of that, so, that they might have us ultimately to, to, to your point, emotions. if I was using Otter AI, I bet if, if you said, I I think it's a good idea if we do X, and if it heard you say, I don't think it's a good idea, and I publish it, what is Nigel saying? He doesn't like this idea, and it was the furor of something that you never said. So mm. I'm leery. I like the idea of minutes, but... Uh, maybe I'm old fashioned. <laughs> I'd still rather take it myself for right or vet them. Well, I got my I own think, little notes yeah, and do that. Right. Yeah, I, th I think it's kind of, I think on things like that where you've got decisions. Um, yeah. And um, the minutes are. Very uh, lightly. So, yeah, I, I would say with the decisions, you need to look at those and go, we've decided this. Okay. Have we? Let's go back because right. you go back to that bit of writing and you listen to the recording and you can hear what it says and you can edit mm -hmm. it and correct it or whatever. I think that right. it's, it's, it's because I've used it for some of my um, uh, writing to, to be able to record, quickly transcribe and then pop it in. Yeah. And I've used yeah. uh, words transcription as well. And I just, it's just an interesting one because I do think it's one of those things that it does, as project managers, you do end up being the note taker. And there is that concept right. of the, he who has the pen has the power in the meeting. 
Right. But actually, he who has the pen or she who has the pen isn't necessarily in the meeting because you're trying to listen to everything rather than process and contribute. And that makes it really hard. We talk about that. We talk about having a scribe. I'm going to get the person that I trust. Anybody. I shouldn't say trust. Go to trust. You know, Mary, I'm always Mary and Joe. Mary, can you, would you mind taking it so I can focus on the things that you talked about, which are somebody talks over somebody else. And wait a minute. Yeah. Somebody was trying to make a point there. And then she's not writing that down, but she's writing the minutes for me. And we go over those at the end. So if at all possible, it's good to have a scribe. That's always been the case. I felt yeah. for quite a while now, if you possibly can. Timekeepers, you can be the timekeeper yourself. Timekeeping is very important. That goes along with the, the I'm, I'm, I'm usually pretty good at that, where I say, 15 minutes left, and they look at me and grumble, say, you can grumble all you want, but there's still 15 minutes left. <laughs> because now yeah. you've grumbled, now there are 14 minutes left, right? Because <laughs> people, here, here's the thing. The, when you do work with people, if it's a half hour meeting, whatever you're doing, exercises, the time goes like this. And so they spend 10 minutes figuring what they're going to do, and they've got 20 minutes left if you're doing some exercise and whatnot or some discussion. You have to keep that thing moving along. You have to be a good timekeeper. There's a balancing act there, and I think running meetings involves uh, you know, emotional intelligence, knowing yourself, how you come across, how to t- read the room, how are people feeling, have your agenda, be large and in charge. Don't worry about being like – I'm not saying fix all these things at the same time, but if your meetings right now stink – <laughs> and you want to get them better, do your own retrospective. Figures out, figure out what's not going well and figure out one thing to fix. Fix that, then fix another thing. Caveat. I think I mentioned you, this to you pre-call, Nigel. If you're working in a toxic environment or the person that's the, that's the goblin, the bully, whatever, is three levels above you, or you're working in a family-run organization and the brother-in-law or the sister-in-law is giving you a hard time, these are harder. They may not be solvable in the same way. So if it's a VP three levels up, I might go to my sponsor and say, somebody from such an organization is disrupting my meetings. I've tried to control it. And maybe the sponsor or my boss has to step in. Just don't try to solve every problem if you're the project manager. I have too many project managers as, as a consultant or, or, or my students who are afraid to escalate. If I escalate, my boss will think of less of me. Well, if you don't escalate and things go south, he'll think yeah. even less of you. When's the right time? You're a manager, I think, of people. Is, am I correct? Yeah. yeah. You, I, is it fair to say, I'll turn the question to you, back to you. Do people, would you prefer that your people never escalate to you and always solve all their problems? Or are there times when they should escalate? No. because they your don't, fine line? The, the thing is, is you have seen the situation where people haven't escalated they've tried to solve it and they've got to the point where it's um, or they don't need to escalate actually mm. coming to me to sound out an approach to deal with the situation isn't an escalation. So if they come to me and say, right, I've got this person, he worked, he works in that area. It's been a right pain in this meeting. I've tried this. I've tried this. I'm going to try this. Does, mm. What does that sound like? Cause I'm there to support them to mentor them right. in, in ways to do it and be that sounding board. And and then mm. I might actually say, don't worry about that. I'll have, him, I'll have a word with them. Do you know what I mean? I may take that on board. I, giving right. me the opportunity to, because it could be one of those things, yeah, I know what you mean. I know they're a pain in the backside. I need mm. to have a word with them, but I need to have a specific word with them because right. I've dealt with them before maybe and I've seen that happen. Um, mm. But again, I think the other point there is also seeking advice because if you go there, mm. I've tried everything that I can think of, boss, in trying right. to solve this situation of this person, this, this, mm-hmm. this, this, this. Mm. I may come up with another tactic. I may also, quite often I'll sit there and go, well, let's, let's, because I'd be more removed, let's sit to the side and think about where they're coming from. What's the problem they've got? What is it that, why are they, are they just an ass, <laughs> Or are they, right. or are they, have they got a problem that we're not addressing? And therefore, right. we need to address them. Is it something else that, that my team member doesn't know about that I know about? It, it, it can be all manner of things. And I think you, it, the answer is always go to your boss. But don't just go, I don't know what to do. I've not tried anything. Because that's exactly. not what you expect. I was going to call you go, that out. You, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you don't you just go there, said... I, help, yeah. help. I don't know what to do. Right. You've gone. I, and I don't, I don't believe in this thing. Come to me with solutions, not problems. Because right, right. I, I don't give a damn if you've got the solution, really. Go and mm. implement it. 
<laughs> that, yeah. That's fine. I don't. Why waste? Why waste their time telling me the good thing that's going to happen when they've right. already worked it out? It's when that's what we're there for is to help when they're mm-hmm. stuck. Right. And sometimes it's just right. perspective that helps that. Yeah. And sometimes it's absolutely you've got to do something completely different and 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 be an escalation up through the trees. Yeah, I think that's the, you said it right. Because if they came to you and said, "I haven't tried anything yet," I thought I'd throw it in your lap. I, I probably did that in my early days of project manager. Because I was, I had, let's put it this way: you learn that one because you have enough people who are your boss to say, "You go figure it out." Or come back when you've tried a couple of things. Oh, I guess I didn't handle that the right way. So yeah, yeah. I would want that as well. Um, and I think most people would want that. But in the meeting situation, you have to know when you can address it, try to address it. And again, if it's if it's that VP who everybody knows is a problem and he's coming to your meeting, well, you know, at least you have the tools of the things yeah. we talked about. Maybe he's going to a lot of bad meetings. Maybe come to your meeting and say, wait a minute, I was ready for a real confrontation. Jim's got an agenda. He's running this meeting. He's getting, maybe he's pissed off because he's never getting to the point where he's getting anything that he really needs. Maybe yeah. he goes to a meeting. Maybe you're the one meeting where he's getting what he needs. And it's like, yeah. it's a breath of fresh air. He spent all day in meetings, which by the way, I think I mentioned to you, maybe it was offline, I can't remember now, Rich came up with a graphic too late to put in our book that showed the effect of back-to-back meetings. I worked mm. at one place with a back-to-back-to-back-to-back-to-back, not me, but other people, and they showed the brain oh, yes. getting more and more stressed as it was like that. So space them out if you can. There's, there's, there's things that can be done instead of this fatalistic, all meetings are bad attitude. Well, I think, I think part of the back-to-back meeting thing also is... Some people see it as a badge of honor. <laughs> yeah, I would have been. I'm in back to I'm even in back to back, so I, I'm so How important. important am I? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and that means I haven't got any of the work done that you want me to do and I've got to sit down in front of T V and watching MasterChef, where they're really good at timing it, meetings and giving you uh, uh doing your approvals for your expensive or whatever. I, do you know what I mean it there is that kind of bravado of of thinking that Right. Uh, whereas I'm I am i am not a paragon of virtue. But I've got big blocks of time in my diary saying, sod off. I'm doing stuff. Right. I'm reading mail. I'm, I worked at one place where they lunch. had those. They, well, I worked at one place where they had those back-to-back meetings. They were scrum masters as you, some years ago before I'd really gotten into Agile. And two people, one woman had actually brought me into the company from a, a class I taught. Two scrum masters. And they would have back-to-back meetings on the phone all day. So they had a cafeteria. And we'd go to the cafeteria, and what they would do, I'd go up there, I was a contractor, and I'd eat. They'd go up, get their lunch, go right back to their desk and work. And I came to realize it was the culture of that place. I wouldn't do it. I didn't do it. I said, I'm not going to do that. They just went back to the, ate at their desk. And I didn't know if that was because I think they just got the idea somewhere in there that that's what one does. And if one wants to get ahead. Have it. And then it becomes this corporate thing where it's like, why am I doing this nutty thing? Because just because everybody around me is doing different topic. But again, they were in back to back means I could see the effect on them. And I think mm. scientifically, we they've proven that that's not a good thing. No, it's, it's yeah. bonkers. It's, it's bonkers yeah. to be like <laughs> Time and in the schedule uh, is good. Yeah, you've got so many good things. And the more senior you get up in the organization, mm-hmm. the more I see it. In mm-hmm. organisations, and I and I, the more I look at that, and I think those are the people you don't want in back-to-back meetings. What right. you want them is I don't care whether they're sitting in a yoga position or they're sat in a meeting room with a whiteboard, strategizing mm-hmm. and thinking about ten years hence for the organisation, and being right that be blue screen that there there that that's where they should. Be. How do we leverage this organisation that far ahead? Not right. that tactical stuff of dealing with what's going on today. Just, and and to well, that point, the people that we go to, I worked for a chief technology officer for about a year and a half, and you better have a good story when you went in his office. I remember mm-hmm. well, two things. <laughs> here's, but here's, I worked for Lotus Development once. It was a good place to work uh, many years ago, and I had a boss there who was a senior manager, and he was my boss's boss. My boss, was, I went to him and I knocked on his door and he said, this better be good. I don't remember what, it, what the topic was anymore. So I told him whatever it was, we resolved it. Later, maybe in the same year, I went to uh, took my family to Disney in Orlando, Florida. And I ran into him at the airport bar. Hey, Jim, how's it going? He was a completely different fellow, of course. Yeah. 
He was a completely different fellow, but he was being in the business mode. So we have to realize that when we go to these people, like you said, to go back to what you said, you want people to have tried something. I want to make sure that I have the best use of their time. If I scheduled a half-hour meeting uh, with um, this chief technology officer, if I can get it done in 10 minutes, he would be very happy. 20 minutes back in his schedule, or he would cut it short or do whatever he could to do that. So I think it's important. To your point about those people thinking, and I talked about how you know, Zoom fatigue, and we talked about people's ability to move around. Steve Jobs was famous for taking long walks. If you ever see the, read the Steve Jobs by Walter Isaacson about Steve Jobs, uh, he's recently written a book about Elon Musk, which I'm not going to read, but I read the Steve Jobs one. And Jobs would say, come take a walk with me. And they would take long walks. He would strategize. And, you know, whatever you want to say about Jobs, how many industries was he significant in? Five, six, seven? Yeah. So, um, you know, taking those walks, moving around. How many times do we have the aha moment in the shower or whatever? I take walks. I don't know how many, unfortunately, I don't have the inspirational things, but I get out of my own head for a while and do that. Get out, get some fresh air. So I think... It's important for people to decompress a little bit. And I think they don't do that. So there's so many things that are psychological, as I think yeah. about it, as you and I talk about it, around running the meeting that have less to do with the grunt work of the meeting and more to do with attitude and, like I said, emotional intelligence. We could talk for an hour about that. Um, you reading the room. When I became an Agile coach, we would say, you should know what happened in the room before you enter the room. You know, what were the dynamics going on there? And that's true of any kind of a meeting, I think, whether it's teaching or anything else. There's so much to it. And I think we are losing uh, – uh, uh, the numbers aren't as good on the success of projects as they should be. I remember when Agile came along and the Agile treated like it was the panacea. And now I find them arguing about things all the time. I said, well, I guess it wasn't. <laughs> but yeah. I know this. I know this. Agile has a lot of meetings. And I know yeah. now that they're being run by people who may or may not know how to run meetings. So I think it's important on either side of the equation to do that. But I would I would tell your listeners and viewers, any kind of a retrospective is good. Looking back and saying, what did we do well? What did we not do so well? What's the one thing we can improve in our next sprint? Or again, if you're running meetings and something happened in the meeting, you go back and say, what's the one thing I could improve? on that meeting what can i did i have an agenda did i have the right people there did i control the meeting let me improve that one thing and then people will they're not going to clamor to come to your meeting and carry you out on their shoulders but they'll they'll not dread <laughs> the thought yeah. of your meeting <laughs> yeah that hopefully they're pretty well run yeah well i'm just i've just spotted that we're coming up on, on an hour and a quarter we've been talking about this oh, okay and and it, it's a fascinating subject and there's probably another two or three hours we could carry on talking about it i'm sure um yeah. it, people I'm, I'm sure people want to find out more there's i know there's loads of uh you've got loads of content uh yourself there's the book itself uh remind us what it's called again it is uh, I'm trying to find it. I can't remember. Where's the, the my it's, list that says the title? Great, mil great meetings build great teams, and it's a guide That's for it. project leaders and agilists, Amazon, the usual places. There's a Kindle version. Uh, there's cool. a uh, print version. Rich and I have talked about an audio version, but that's another project. If only not that many people have, have requested it, but it's very much of a nuts and bolts how to run a meeting. It is not lofty. It is not academic i had to pull rich away from the academic because he is an academic so we try to make a, a brief handbook a couple hundred pages on how to run a meeting if you adopt a couple of the techniques you're ahead of the game i think something about the yeah. science of it and whatnot so it's good stuff brilliant and if people want like to get think. in touch with you what's the best way uh they can i'll give you my email address they can email me if they want i don't care it's cool. uh jay stewart so, J-S-T-E-W-A-R-T at J-P Stewart Consulting, J-P-S-T-E-W-A-R-T Consulting.com. That's my professional email. I'm fine. I'll talk to people, email them, whatever, you know. I, I, you you mm -hmm. and I talked about that. We mentor people. We talk to people. People don't tie me down for months at a time. They ask a question or two, and they move on. So, I can, if I can be of help, that'd be great. Brilliant. Well, Jim, thank you so much. 
uh, for giving me so much time and such an interesting, fascinating talk. There's a few things in there. I think I think I need to apply some retrospective to some of my meetings as well again and kind of uh, start thinking about that attention around all the people who are in that meeting. And the meetings I've had today that I know that I'm going to um, rethink about how and reframe how I might have done them and uh, maybe give some fix advice one and thing. some others. Fix yeah. one thing. Like so. If you're thinking five things, fix five things. But yeah. if you try to fix five things, you might say, I can't fix them all, I'll fix none. If the worst thing that happened was it ran over or they all ran over, try to fix that. Yeah, that's it, right. ideal. Brilliant. Yep. Well, have a wonderful rest of your day, and yep. uh, it's good to speak to you. Thanks very Thanks, much. Thanks, Nigel. Take care. Thank you. Another great sponsor of the show it comes in the form of Air Manual. Um, Air Manual is a well, it's a tool for documenting process, which um, and best practices. Um, uh, it's run. It's, it's a company formed by a guy, one of my uh, interviewees, uh, Alexis Kingsbury. Um, essentially, uh, and, I, and I kind of summarised why my view of where we see documentation and my experience has been: people will document something, a process, they'll put it in a, a Visio diagram that gets loaded onto a SharePoint site or something similar. And then a bunch of pro- that. So then, once that, that diagram has been shared with senior management, they're happy. They have a process in the business. But then the, the detailed procedures underneath it might be in Word documents, in, uh, just poorly kept and not linked easily and not updated. And what Air Manual does, it allows you to put in a. It's a tool for doing this kind of thing. You whack it in. Uh, the service in there, get in there, put in your process, your flow, and you build it down to as low a level of detail, even to the point of checklists where people can check off they've done it. So it creates that um, uh, guided checklists, um, easy to create, easy to maintain, and all in one place. And no one's kind of rooting around to find the SharePoint, and then when you change to new SharePoint services and all that stuff, it, it's all there. So if you pop along to nigelcreaser.com slash airmanual, um, there's a bit more detail there and a link there to click on to um, go and get. I think uh, they offer a trial and things like that. So uh, uh, it, uh, it, it's something that I think uh, can easily um, reduce the amount of errors, rework, etc. within our organisation. So um, yeah, take a look. So this is my final wrap up. Every week you're going to hear this. You're going to get bored of it, but you can always click next podcast if so. Um, If you have enjoyed it, if you've listened to this podcast to the end of this uh, show and you think that was great, I'd love to be able to help Nigel out. Um, There are loads of ways you can do it. Um, The the first and and obvious way is to um, share the podcast. Send it out to people. Um, if you if you know for colleagues and friends who'd benefit from it, you think they'd enjoy it, just send them the link. Grab one of the links send, or send them to www.nigelcreaser.com slash podcasts. That's ni- www.nigelcreaser.com slash podcasts. And that will push them over to a, um, a link tree link and it's got all of the different ways they can consume the, the podcast. Uh, if you are feeling generous and have a big bag of cash, you could grab a copy of one of my books. Obviously, um, uh, they're available in all the usual places, and print and, and, and digital. Again, jump on the website, uh, www.nigelcreaser.com slash shop, and that will give you a list of all the different ways that you can contribute um, and, and grab copies of the book. Also got... Um, links to all my guests books on there as well where I get a little bit of a kickback from them Um, if you are of a sporting mind um, I have a number through doing some of my uh, judo and and running uh, antics Uh, I've managed to secure a few um, uh, affiliate links and affiliates uh, there as well so in there somewhere in the sponsors page there's links to those as well so clicking onto those and grabbing uh, your if you're and with it, if you're looking to uh, get super fit, then that would be fabulous as well. And I get a little kickback from those. Uh, I have a Patreon account. It's 
patreon.com slash Sunday lunch PM. Uh, so again, you can ping something in there, buy me a coffee or whatever. And finally, obviously the most important is coming back, coming back, listen again. Um, because, uh, the more of you that come back, uh, the more, uh, visibility I get because there's more times that it's downloaded and all the SEO works and things like that. So yeah, that's it. So, uh, if you can help me out, I would be much appreciated. If you can't, don't worry about it. Thank you very much. Cheers now. Bye. Uh, my latest, uh, the, the, the latest uh, affiliate that I've got on the show now is Riverside. Um, I use Riverside to do my interviews, Riverside FM. Um, <clears throat> it kind of offers you a whole, if you like, micro studio management producer tool and, and, and goes beyond that. has a really good free layer <clears throat> and I, um, I've been using it for a while now. I find it really good when I've had issues, even though I'm not on one of the higher paid levels, the support has been quick, responsive and, and, and of high quality and, and people keen to help me. Uh, the organization seems really good. The product seems really intuitive um, and uh, quality is really good as well. And they, it's a clever way of doing it is when you're, you're recording through your browsers, so you're not got loads of desktop resources being used compared to some other products that I've used. Uh, and what they also do is they do a, um, they stream a, a lower quality version of it up onto uh, as you're doing the interview. So you're not burning bandwidth while you're doing the interview and potentially uh, impacting on the quality of the conversation. Uh, and then at the end, it uploads it, uh, the, the higher quality from your browser. Um, I mean, it, it's just a really good way of doing it. So, um, if you are um, thinking of doing a podcast and you're doing a podcast, I, I would recommend using this tool. I find it really good. Best, best of the tools that I've tried using um, today. And you can get that nigelcreaser.com slash riverside and that will redirect you to uh, my kickback page uh, on their site and there I will get a little kickback uh, from them. So um, take a look. Thanks. Well, it's goodbye from me, Nigel Creaser, and it's goodbye from him, the Sunday Lunch PM. Goodbye.